Welcome to The Open Door. Jim Hannink here with fellow panelists Mario Ramos-Reyes and Christopher Zender. Today, we'll discuss the surprise popular series, The Queen's Gambit, and what it tells us about the corrosive Netflix effect. Our special guest is Josh Herring. His work has appeared on Public Discourse, The Imaginative Conservative, and The Federalist. He is Dean of Students at Thales Academy. Josh has a Master of Divinity degree and is a doctoral candidate at Faulkner University. As always, we begin in prayer. Come, O Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation through Christ our Lord. Amen. Josh, as we get started, could you tell us a bit about your background? Sure, and uh, please uh, do let me begin with uh, just thanking you for the invitation. This was a, a delight to uh, get to come on your show and uh, talk about the show and the book a little bit. So uh, I'm a graduate of Hillsdale College for undergraduate. That's where I did a bachelor's in history. And then I went on to Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. And that's the last degree I finished. Uh, uh, my wife and I settled in North Carolina in part because she was at University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And I was over at Southeastern Seminary in Wake Forest. And I picked up a job teaching at Thales Academy eight years ago now. I thought I was getting into teaching as a way to pay the bills while getting through seminary and discovered that along the way, uh, God sort of changed what I thought was the calling from heading into pastoral ministry to going into teaching. Uh, that's been eight years since. Uh, last year, uh, literally about a year ago now, uh, I got a promotion to become dean of students and get to sort of straddle uh, half administration and half teaching. For the past year, I've been having a, a diminished teaching load, but have some more administrative responsibilities and a, a bigger role in helping to form a positive school culture at our, our high school and middle school. We're a 612 campus. Uh, three years ago, I started a doctoral program with Faulkner University and working through their Great Books Honors Program. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's, oh, I should also mention, uh, I do have a deep love for speech and debate. Uh, that's, that's been, that sort of turned into a hobby that uh, grew into a, a part-time gig that, uh, so now I coach a growing team. I was just looking at our next tournament. I'm trying to get as many of our 30 regular competitors at the next tournament as possible. So yeah, that's, that's me. Well, we know that uh, Mario Ramos Reyes is a, a classicist of some <laughs> renown, and he'll probably want to ask you a bit about the curriculum at Thales Academy. Yes, um, I was very curious what I read about your background. Um, and I read about uh, the Tales Academy, which it seems to offer a classical curriculum. Um, would you mind ex um, expanding a little bit about that? How it, uh, it's, uh, what it's offering and so? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, now we we're, we are a we're a classical school, and that that's something that we kind of never quite get tired of talking about. What exactly does it mean for us to be a classical school? Uh, and I know different schools use that in different ways. Um, for us, uh, I'll at least answer that probably in along two lines, like our in terms of our curriculum, and then philosophically, where does that put us? In terms of our curriculum, uh, it does mean that it kind of commits us to a certain pathway. Uh, that we're kind of always following. Mo all of our humanities subjects are lined up in terms of uh, they go through ancient and then medieval and then modern. 
uh, and as appropriate to the discipline. So we've got literature and history that kind of do that uh, aligned. We do, we insist that students have to take Latin through middle school and then they can choose between Latin or Spanish in high school. Uh, we offer a trivium track of courses in our curriculum where students take research and writing in ninth grade, formal logic in 10th grade, philosophy in 11th grade, and then senior year is spent writing the senior thesis. Uh, we offer, I, mean, I, I don't know if there's anything terribly classical about the way we do this, but we, we also offer kind of the, the standard math and science tracks, uh, and depending on their math level, uh, students can, uh, they can set themselves up to finish AP Calculus BC by the end of high school, and also they can set themselves up to take AP Physics in senior year, but that all kind of depends on choices they make and levels that they get to. Uh, so curricularly for us, that means we're committed to teaching an awful lot of stuff. <laughs> we, we insist that students need to read a lot. They need to think a lot. Pedagogically, we're committed to using a Socratic seminar method across all of our classes. Uh, we, we don't throw lecture to the side completely. I, I find that there are times when, like if I'm going to set up a discussion of Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative, I need to teach them what that is. They, they, my 11th graders are not capable of just reading Kant without help. They need some help, but we build to the point where we can have a free flowing conversation about Kant. So all of that's in terms of our curriculum. Um, I, I have trouble sometimes thinking about what does it mean philosophically for us to be a classical school? Because uh, there are some schools, particularly in the Catholic classical tradition that have a much more clear, firm philosophical basis. We're a secular classical academy. Uh, we have students from all faith backgrounds and no faith backgrounds, and that makes it trickier sometimes for us. Uh, so, but philosophically, we do have a, a few convictions that we've kind of worked into our, our language. Uh, the first of those is that we are committed to uh, a position of human dignity. Uh, we think that human beings have a certain amount of value and what we're doing as a classical school is helping our students understand who they are and what role they have to play in in the world uh, we also make the uh sometimes shocking claim that virtue truth and happiness are all real and those are real things that we can find through study and so we have a, a system of virtues we call them the 15 Thales outcomes that we insist that students do all actually need to embody. Uh, they actually need to seek truth and they need to be people of integrity. And if they do that, uh, I think we, uh, we, 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 can, we tend to concur with Aristotle that uh, living a virtuous life is the best place to find happiness. No guarantees of a happy life, but that's, that's where we think we'll find it. Uh, the best description I've run into recently, at least, uh, that I think helps navigate some of our tensions as a school is uh, from uh, uh, Carl Truman's new book on the triumph of the, the modern self. He talks about a distinction between poiesis and mimesis, where uh, sometimes we're trying to, I think we, we're kind of stuck at this tension point as a classical school, where we do believe that every student has the ability to make himself or herself into the person they're becoming. And they do have a lot of things about the world that they can create through their choices. But at the same time, we do think there is a reality that they have to discover, they have to learn, they need to know things. And so we're kind of constantly trying to help students choose to become their best selves while also helping them discover things that are really unchangeable about the world. So all of that at least is what is kind of stewing around in my mind when we say we're a classical school. It's all of that. It's also all the apparatus of just a school food and discipline and carpool lines and all those things. So I've, I've been rambling. Any, any other thoughts? We yeah, should... well, we're, we're going to uh, very shortly turn to the Queen's Gambit. And Christopher Zender is going to lead us in that direction. He allows us how his daughter, one of his daughters, has just finished the, the whole series. But you mentioned Kant. And, and I, I wonder how much you're able to keep abreast of the latest Kant scholarship. For example, recently, just recently, uh, in a German library somewhere, a small pizza order of Kant's was found. Yes, 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 they had pizzas back then. And on that pizza order, he wrote, 
hold the antinomies. <laughs> I think we're supposed to laugh at that point. <laughs> oh, Christopher Sander, who follows German research and all of that and doesn't like anchovies. Uh, now I think he's poised to move us back into the sphere of sobriety. Of course, as always. <laughs> it's strange I should be asking this question because I've never read the novel called The Queen's Gambit and I never watch Netflix. So, um, so it's, it's, it's a mystery to me what, what the interest is in it. So um, what, what inspired your interest to write about the Queen's Gambit, both the novel and the movie or the Netflix series? Yeah, the, the, the naming there got, got tricky. I, I went through several different like revision steps in the essay trying to figure out how do I distinguish between these two different versions of, mm -hmm. of the story? Uh, honestly, I, I don't have a great answer for your question. I, I read about it in part because I watched the show because Netflix threw it on the top of my queue and said, hey, this is one of the high, this is ranked number one nationwide. And I was kind of curious. I don't play chess. Uh, my what? Essay, what? Uh, I know. I, I'm sorry. Oh. Oh. I, I, and I, I, I say I don't play chess. I mean, I don't play chess in the sense that you see in the show. Like the show kind of, show, it demonstrates like the strategy of chess and you kind of, it takes you into the mindset of someone who can, use the language of chess, like C4 and B5 and name all of these people and moves that I don't know what any of them are, but the show kind of, it explains it as you go. Uh, I, I watched one episode expecting to be like, giving it kind of a sort of a five minute test. Am I interested in this show? Is it worth the story? I was immediately hooked. Uh, I also like the fact that it was a complete story in seven episodes. It was not an endless saga that was gonna be trapped in for like years if I really am committed to the show. Uh, and I thought the show was really, really good. Uh, I liked the show a lot. Uh, it was not nearly as gross as a lot of Netflix original programming tends to be. Uh, and I was kind of, I wanted more. I was like, okay, what, what, what happens next? What's behind this? And a little bit of internet searching revealed that it's based on the uh, 1983 novel by Walter Tevis of the same name, The Queen's Gambit. So I ordered the book and I read the book. And what struck me as really interesting was the distinction between like two very different ways of telling the same story. And it's not even that they're wildly divergent. It's just like two, I mean, it's, they're, they're going off from a single point. The story remains the same. It's about a young woman named Beth who has a shockingly intuitive grasp of chess and by the end of the story, uh, spoiler, I guess, but not really, uh, she does beat the Russian grandmaster international chess player guy. And, but the way the story was told, I thought struck me as like really interesting. And that tends to be my sort of writing process. I, I just kind of read and think about stuff and watch shows and think about them. And eventually I brought in so much that something has to come out. And usually it's the form of an essay. So I don't know if that's really an answer to your question or not, but I sort of was intrigued and just kind of kept following it and then woke up one morning with an essay bubbling out and typed it out. And uh, then public discourse liked the essay. So there we go. Yeah, yeah, I, that answers the question fine. Um, what do you think the differences between the novel and the movie are for those who haven't read your essay? Sure. I, I think the, the real difference of it uh, is really a, I think it has a lot to do with the difference in what uh, the way human potential is portrayed. In the novel, the protagonist is a clearly flawed young woman. She grows up in an orphanage and in the orphanage, they have this practice of giving tranquilizer pills to the kids. And uh, at the same time as she's growing up in the orphanage, she also meets an older uh, man who's a janitor. His name is Scheibel. He teaches her how to play chess. Well, the show, directly connects her success in chess to a side effect of the tranquilizers. Uh, the protagonist forms a lifelong addiction to tranquilizer pills that once she's out of the orphanage, it's really easy for her, relatively speaking, to get them. So she's always taking tranquilizer pills. The show connects her success to her drug addiction. 
But the novel shows that instead, she's actually always fighting her temptation to take these pills. And instead, the, the pills actually do what I think we would all suspect, that tranquilizer pills would actually dull her mind. And so she has to sort of manage her addiction in the novel. There are times when she knows she's not going to play chess for three days. That's the time she could indulge in her. <clears throat> but instead, the, there's several scenes where uh, the same scene from the novel is shown in the TV show, but the show portrays her victory as coming from her drug addiction. And I think the same kind of trend goes throughout. Uh, the show makes her a worse version of the character, where the novel shows her fighting her own worst inclinations to sort of overcome those. And so by the end of both stories, what you get is a win, but Netflix shows somebody who wins through her vice. Her vice is actually what causes her to win. But the novel shows her as this human person who's uh, even though, I mean, I don't think I would ever teach my kids like, ah, oh, yes, get a drug addiction so that you can develop the ability to overcome your drug addiction. You see this triumph of uh, some level of virtue where she's still able to put off her worst desires to pursue a greater end. And so that in my mind is the big difference here where you've got this better version of what a person is capable of in uh, the novel, as opposed to Netflix showing us really just this person whose worst habits actually cause her eventual success. So virtue, so success through dissipation is the movie, yeah. I think so, though at the same time, I don't want to, I don't want to downplay that it really is a good, it's a good show. Like it's, it's well plotted, it has great characters, the settings are gorgeous. I, all, the, uh, all the techniques of modern storytelling through film are, are there, it's excellently crafted but it's the messaging that seems different. So what you are perceiving then is that there is a difference in what we may call an anthropology behind these two way of narrating the story. Am I um, accurate in my description or? I, 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 would, I think so. I, mean, I think uh, Netflix anthropology sees us as purely material creatures who when we can, and, and since we're only material, whatever brings us pleasure is ultimately best. And uh, so there is no higher transcendence, there's no metaphysic, there's no soul there. Whereas Tevis has room for a, a higher anthropology. We exist body and soul. So though for Tevis, it makes perfect sense in his novel that uh, Beth can really perceive something greater and she can pursue that greater thing. And so she's really, uh, maybe to use some of Plato's language, she's uh, ruling, the head is ruling the heart rather than there being just the heart and the desires. So um, the novel then has a more classical anthropology and then the movie or the series has a, we may call, I don't know, modern, some kind of modern type of anthropology, but not all modern because if you compare it with Kant, probably Khan would completely disagree with that. So my question is, do you think that type of um, portrait of the novel uh, emphasizing these um, tendencies or uh, vices, if you will, um, have a consequence on people who are watching the, the young people when they are um, growing up. I want to make sure I understand is, that question. I, I, is there any negative consequences on those who are watching the movie and see that happening? In other words, uh, what is happening is that you can improve your life, if you will, or you can give a success through certain vices. I definitely think there's a, I think there's a direct impact or maybe direct is the wrong word there, but there's definitely a connection. And I would want to, but I want to limit the connection to the level of critical engagement that's brought to the show or to the, to whatever somebody's consuming. And I think it's sort of a truism that the, uh, the garbage in garbage out there, there's a lot of truth to that. Um, so I think there's for people viewing for particularly children and teenagers viewing that who are taking it in without any kind of thought, without, anal without analysis, without weighing 
what am I consuming here? I think there's definitely a subconscious, there can be a very clear subconscious influence. Uh, I think the, it's, it seems pretty apparent to me that the stories that we tell are very significant. The, the stories we uh, consume are also very significant. I mean, stories are a phenomenal way of conveying moral truths. Uh, and, and certainly, uh, or even moral principles that then can be lived out, whether they're true or false. So I think it's something, I think it's interesting that this is not the first time Netflix has done this. I mean, it's kind of a relative, I think it's a relatively widespread phenomenon in Netflix original programming, Amazon original programming, where you get this sort of um, really negative anthropology that where the message that's shown over and over and over again is that the satisfaction of your basis desires is actually the route towards happiness. So instead of that more traditional or classical view that actually the road to happiness involves discipline, virtue, self-control, uh, where kind of even that, that's been plenty of thinkers have made that the distinction between the human person and the animal, where our rationality allows us to govern our desires. Whereas my cats, my dogs can't govern their desires really, except through a bare minimum pleasure pain dynamic. But that's not even really rational as much as like, they know they don't want me to like hit them or starve them or whatever. I don't starve my pets, just lest anybody be ready to file a lawsuit or anything. But there's something there that that's really different for people. And I think there's, there definitely is something that's going on in the way those stories are told. But I mean, I also, that, that's also kind of, endemic, I think, to, it's, it's wider even than just online streaming. I mean, that's also pretty common in, mo the mo in modern novels and modern literature as well. I mean, so I think we still have a pretty widespread uh, effect, if you will, but there's a, there's a dilemma, there's, there's a problem there if, we're, if the constant stories that we consume and that we begin to believe and we begin to live out are that what will make me happy is getting the lowest, worst thing that I want. And that's, we're, we're missing something if that's the greatest good that we can aspire to. One of our, our readers and one of our listeners uh, submitted a question. And since you're a debater, uh, I put the question in the form of uh, the debate. Resolved. Netflix is really just one player in a larger feedback loop designed to perpetuate a damaging message, much like a virus that replicates itself to infect others. You're going to debate that? You're going to take the affirmative? You're going to take the negative? <laughs> Divide the question? Oh, so many, so many avenues. Um, well, uh, if, if anybody does want to actually have this debate, I am happy to host it over on my podcast, What's the Res? We do uh, debate analysis and occasional live debates when we have uh, good resolutions. This could be really fun uh, to debate. Um, uh, my initial, I always teach my students that you can't, you, you can't really just debate the side you initially agree with. You have to if it's really going to be a debate, you have to be able to jump sides. So I make all of them write affirmative and negative cases on whatever resolution. So my initial gut would go with agreeing with this resolution. Uh, and a lot of things we've already been discussing. I mean, I think this is uh, Netflix is just one of many players in an online space that doesn't have a lot of the restrictions that traditional media has to deal with. I mean, there's, we don't have decency laws hap, uh, interfering with Netflix's creative license. And uh, in the absence of those structures, Netflix seems to have total freedom. Uh, but it's a, it's a total libertarian freedom in the sense of like, freedom means I can do whatever I want as long as I don't hurt anybody. But they're missing the, the what I would argue is really the older sense, like Augustine's understanding of freedom, where freedom is the freedom to do good. Uh, if you do wrongly, you've actually misused your freedom. Your freedom was freedom to do the right thing. That's really what Netflix is, is all about. But I think, I mean, ultimately, if I was actually arguing AF on this one, I would, I would want to take, I'd go to spend a lot of time on that first clause. Netflix is really just one player in a larger feedback loop. Uh, Netflix is probably an obvious symptom, but it's really just a symptom. It's not itself the cause. 
the cause would push us back towards a much larger discussion about modernity, post-modernity, uh, some of the things that Charles Taylor identifies in his book, A Secular Age and the Eminent Frame and the loss of a larger metaphysic that where we can actually affirm things are true, good, or beautiful. That's where I would probably want to go on Av. Now, if I was going to argue neg here, um, I would probably, my negative analysis would focus on uh, this is the necessary price tag of freedom of speech and artistic creativity. Those are kind of my initial argument angles, I think. I was like, if we're really going to affirm freedom of speech, then we have to affirm that this kind of use of freedom of speech is itself good if we want to affirm freedom of speech of other things. And I would then probably want to go find counterexamples where Netflix has actually created really good stuff. Uh, last night, I watched the Netflix version of uh, J.D. Vance's book, uh, Hillbilly Elegy. I was enthralled. I mean, that was an excellent movie. It was, uh, and J.D. Vance at least has gone on uh, at least one interview affirming that uh, Ron Howard's directorship and Netflix's general curation of his book. Uh, it's not to say that Netflix always creates terrible things. And even in the middle of terrible Netflix shows, which I honestly would probably put their new steamy romantic thing, Bridgerton, it's pretty bad in places. But it also has some great moral truths in the middle of garbage scenes. So it's, it's not as simple as I might want to put it as this kind of resolution puts it of perpetuating a damaging message. There's, there's good and bad in there. So there's at least my initial analysis. I was wondering um, that if, if, you take, if you take that analysis, um, isn't it even, isn't it worse though that Netflix has good stuff? Because that draws you one in to the whole Netflix reality, right? The whole Netflix problem. So yeah, you're drawn in with the good stuff, but sooner or later, it's, you're, it's, you're gonna have to take the poison as well. I think that's a very fair, I think it's a very fair analysis. And I mean, honestly, it, that's part of why I think, um, I, I don't think we're alone in this. My wife and I have this pretty consistent pattern of getting Netflix for two or three months and we'll watch stuff that we want to watch on Netflix, but then it's as if we've exhausted everything that's actually of value there. And I mean, Netflix is this giant machine churning out all kinds of stuff. And some of it is actually like really good. I really like it, but we exhaust that pretty quickly. Um, so I think I would push back rather than like a, a wholesale rejection. I would probably go back to this involves analysis and discretion and uh, maybe the, the older language of prudence is helpful here. That this, this is a place for prudently evaluating, is this actually good for me? <laughs> is this something I should watch? Uh, or, and maybe if there is nothing that is, uh, what was St. Paul's line, uh, whatever is noble, whatever is good, whatever is true, whatever is beautiful, think on these things, brothers. <laughs> if I've run out of stuff that fits those criteria, I probably, it's about time for me to cancel my subscription again. How about this, though? <laughs> it, it, the question is, is good for me, but is Netflix good for society? Oh, Netflix is terrible for society. Okay, so should we even at all be supporting it? given what, what it does? Uh, so I, I find that really hard because uh, I don't want to, and honestly, it was one of the, it was one of my hesitancies about putting this article like out there as a, mm -hmm. I think it's really easy to get to the point of saying, here are these five clearly morally problematic things. Therefore we reject the whole system within which those five morally problematic things exist. And I, I just don't know that that's possible. I, mean, I, I don't know that I, I would have trouble saying because that's the case, I'm gonna get rid of that because I think I would then need to, I mean, I can point to all kinds of, we can find pornography in ancient Greek mythology really easily, but I'm still going to teach Hesiod's Theogony. I'm still going to teach Aphrodite coming from the literal balls of, that are thrown into the ocean and that she is born out of the sea foam I'm going to teach that scene in Hesiod, even though like if it's visually portrayed, I would not be able to explain why it's art. I'm not going to reject all of paganism because it does have some terrible things in it. 
Mario, you look like you have a thought there. Yes. He um, always does. <laughs> a, a few things, uh, but I'm not sure that I'm going to summarize them. But um, I'm just thinking about what you are saying. Um, what we need, uh, correct me, I'm wrong, is a judgment about what we see. So a judgment means a way by which we are evaluating what we are seeing, and then we convey to the young people, if you will, the way by which the method by which they can assess what they are watching. Otherwise, we are going to live in, I don't know, in a, in a ghetto, and we live in the world. And that lead me to what you already said, the classicism that you are teaching uh, in itself is good, but then we live in a world which is not precisely shaped by that uh, view. We live in a liberal democracy, which is mainly procedural. It's not, there's no substantive values anymore, but we need to somehow reconcile to at least survive there. Now, my question is, um, to what you attribute these ideas that are conveyed by uh, Netflix. It is because there is a disease, uh, this is Jack Manitan words, uh, come from modernity. Uh, and if that's the case, when we convey our ideas, then we can persuade other people. Or if that is the case, is that really enough for us? In other words, if we counter an argument to what is being portrayed, portrayed there. Is that enough for the young people to be persuaded? Because what I notice uh, in young student is that for them, there are rational evidences that are evidence for them. In other words, they are being persuaded by watching um, Netflix much more than listening to, to us to speak about, I don't know, the, um, the ontological argument. What do you think is the best way to address that? Man, well, that, I'm just going to point out that that is the million dollar question. I think every teacher, every professor in America would, would agree with you that uh, uh, our, our students would much rather binge the latest season than they would attend class and listen to a discussion on the ontological argument. Um, well, since this is a, a Christian show, I'll, I'll just answer your question honestly at first. And so I think the, the root of the problem is the doctrine of sin. I mean, the, and the, the, I mean the, the people's internal inclinations are first and foremost sinful. We gravitate towards laziness rather than work. We gravitate towards vice rather than virtue. Uh, education can go to a certain degree, can mitigate some of those sinful desires, but I don't think education can replace, it can't get rid of those sinful desires. That requires the, uh, that literally is the grace of God through the resurrection of Christ that can literally bring the dead soul to life uh, within, the soul, within the person and can give them a new heart. I, I think that's why you see throughout the Old Testament People of Israel are continually surrounded by evil. And even though they have the literal word of God, the living word of prophets, <laughs> the memory and action of miracles in their very midst, they still are tempted by the orgies of Baal and Asherah all around them, all throughout the Old Testament. Uh, it, it never goes away. And uh, so I think there's, there's part of that. It's just like, that's always been the case. I think it will always be the case. The form of the temptation may shift, but the reality of the temptation is unavoidable, unavoidable until Christ's return and all things are made new. All that being said, um, I do think that part of what we're looking at there uh, is, is really, it, a lot of it has to do with, I think, creating or doing everything we can to help students cognitively know when they are harming themselves. Uh, and uh, so particularly when following their desires in a somewhat innocent direction could lead to the erosion of their ability to actually perceive truth, beauty, and goodness. That's one thing if you're just gonna like do a bad thing and it has no actual effect. There are very few of those. I can't even, I, I don't even know what that would be. 
but it's a really terrible problem when the, har the habits that we develop literally remove our ability to perceive what is good. And all we can do is perceive what is bad. Uh, I'm thinking of pornography there, but I, the example I usually use in my class is drugs and the, the way that long-term drug addiction removes people's ability to taste things. Uh, and my, my comparison is usually, I, I, if, I'm, if I have a younger crowd, I'll stay away from drug comparison. I'll talk about drinking Coca-Cola to the extent that you cannot perceive the distinction in other things anymore. It's like sugar washes out all the flavors. So if people are literally harming themselves, through the media they consume, I think that puts on those who perceive the harm kind of two responsibilities. On the one hand, uh, we should be waving a flag and saying, you are hurting yourself. I can't take away your ability to choose the bad thing, but I should so constantly remind you that you're choosing the bad thing that your conscience is provoked and awakened. But secondly, uh, I do think we should use, and I mean that in a rather utilitarian sense, like use the human inclination towards beauty uh, in our favor. I think this is where uh, Tolkien and Lewis were absolute geniuses in that through, I think Lewis probably a little more intentionally so than Tolkien, but both of them created beautiful stories that engage the mind, engage the soul, and are reawakening a sense of wonder all without the reader knowing it. <laughs> Uh, I, I read Narnia probably 50 times between ages seven and 12. I had no idea that I was actually getting a dense uh, three layer theology class every time I worked through books one through seven. But Lewis did that through telling great stories. Um, I, I don't wanna just like rail on Netflix. I also wanna say like this calls, and I, I'm not this, I can't do this. I've tried to write novels and short stories and poems, they're terrible. But I think there are people, that God, I think God is calling men and women in Christendom to literally make better stories. <laughs> Don't make the terrible Christian movies that I grew up with. I'm thinking of uh, the Left Behind the movie from when I was like 12. That was awful. Don't make that. But um, uh, make movies that are of the level of quality that Pixar makes and make them that are so good that they enchant the mind and they sort of undo the bad stuff that consuming bad media does. So let, let, me, let, let me backtrack a little bit here and, and lead us into the deep pools of philosophy and theology where you've already shown us that you're, you're not fearful to, to swim. Uh, on inclinations, uh, the three of us are a pretty nasty group, but we're all Thomists, and we all believe as Thomists that the way we first of all identify the goods for the person is through our inclinations. And it seemed to me that you were saying something like we're naturally inclined to uh, what's not good, whereas it seems to us that we're naturally inclined to what is good. And it seems to us that we're a pretty nasty bunch, but we're not nasty through and through. Uh, and because of that, even our nastiness, we can turn towards the good. Think of our motto, Rome, rum, and rebellion. Uh, would you care to uh, uh, focus a bit on our inclinations? Would that would that be our uh, our communal human inclination to Rome, rum, or rebellion? Which which one would you uh, would you prefer? <laughs> well, being uh, radicals, we see them as inextricably intertwined. Well, if we're going cards on the table, uh, my my seminary attendants hopefully made this pretty obvious, but. Uh, uh, I'm a Baptist through and through. I have a lot of wonderful friends. Well, I could tell that even if you hadn't mentioned it. I mean, I, I we, lo we love you anyway. <laughs> uh, a longtime member of this show is Matthew Marshall, who's as Baptist as they get. Uh, sometimes, sometimes he goes, he goes to Anabaptistry. 
But that's all right, because there's a bridge, rebellion, right? Rebellion is a bridge to the Anabaptist tradition. Uh, Call it that, my friend. Well, uh, so basically, I, I, I would just double down. I, I mean, I, 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 I hear the, I don't entirely know how to mediate this tension, but I, I do simultaneously. As uh, an academic, you refer to it as a tension. Okay. <laughs> that's part of academic life. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, one of the I, I think one of my favorite parts about uh, being called into teaching instead of the ministry is that I can fervently hold tensions without feeling any obligation to resolve them for the pulpit. <laughs> um, but there, there is this tension between the extent of original sin and the fact that some level of the divine image remains. And so on the one hand, I would completely affirm that like our natural desires are base. Uh, I naturally prefer lust to chastity. That's the natural inclination. Uh, but it's God's grace that there are all kinds of mediating things, uh, including some remnant of the fact that the conscience reminds us that we, uh, there are things that are wrong and there are things that are right, uh, that even through that, I mean, I, I can be corrupted beyond the minimum, and uh, I can also recognize goodness. Uh, so I don't really know how to resolve that without, I don't want to deny the extent of original sin, because I do think that's essential for all kinds of other philosophical and theological reasons. I was, one of my current research projects has had me diving into Mormonism, and that that's become a huge distinction there as well. Like when, once you deny the extent of original sin, it's really easy to come up with all kinds of other things. So I don't want to deny that um, as the most, it was the most persuasive argument against full-blown five-point Calvinism I've ever heard that if you truly go all in on total depravity and you weight that total more heavily than you weight depravity, uh, the, the problem becomes that you have no way to explain the fact that pagans actually do desire good things. And we lose the ability to say like, okay, yeah, Plato and Aristotle both saw some things that were true. They also, as far as we know, were not redeemed by God's grace. So how do you explain that? I'm like, well, I, I don't feel any need to explain that, <laughs> except that like there are things that God still uses to call people to himself and they, they don't hear the entirety of the call in some way. So I would, I would argue that yes, there are things that still uh, do call people to better versions of themselves short of full gospel faith. But I also don't want to abandon the fact that people are naturally wicked and left to their own devices. People prefer sin to really anything else. But God has also given us all kinds of other mediating institutions, the family, the church, the state, all at some level, uh, whether they are fully Christian versions of those things or fully secular versions of those things, the worst families in the world still keep people more orderly than disorderly. The worst states in the world still maintain some level of morality in their legal codes. So those now, things- even, even Christopher Zender can maintain a level of moderation in his smoking. <laughs> uh, he's very familiar with the Lutheran tradition. Uh, Pekka Fortiter said Fortius Fide, and perhaps he has some uh, once again, sobering insights for us here. I don't know if I have any insights sobering or otherwise. Uh, <laughs> He's a modest man. <laughs> yes, I was, I was, my family is um, Lutheran since Martin Luther. I was, I, I returned to the faith of my distant fathers when I was 19. So uh, and I was once a full believer in total depravity. Um, I think it's, it's interesting when you say that, that, men naturally desire sin. Is that they desire sin or they desire the apparent good? I mean, do I really desire something that's evil in itself? Oh, well, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't deny the, 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 I think it's Augustine and Thomas who both, um, they both argue that a, every sin is a misdirected good, right? So, I mean, that's, that's, the, that's the nature of e evil is not a thing in itself. Evil is the absence of the good, or it's a divergence from the good. The Greek term for sin, hamartia, itself refers to missing the mark as like an archery term. So a sin is not, 
Uh, and it's not the, you, you really can't have virtue without vice as its defining quality. To be honest means to not lie and so on. So, um, I mean, I, I think there's a, there's a, there, there's definitely a pairing there. Um, but again, I, I'm not gonna, I, I'm not gonna deny, I'm still not, I'm not willing to affirm the, the, uh, a, a natural desire for good, or even if there is a, even if there is a natural desire for good, the youngest child ignores that desire. The youngest child, any, I suspect any of the four of us could come up with as an example, prefers selfishness to love. There is no natural inclination to caritas in the, the, the six month old's heart or the one year old's heart, uh, old enough to walk and steal a toy from another child. There, there is still, there is theft and there is greed at the base of human nature. I don't know. I mean, it seems to me human beings are actually naturally cooperative. Um, I, I think, I, I think what you're talking about, is, but the fundamental reality is not selfishness. The fundamental reality is a desire to cooperate. Just as in nature, the fundamental reality is not um, struggle between species, but rather a kind of, um, a kind of natural cooperation. Um, I think biology has shown that more and more. Um, so I, I guess I would I would disagree with that. I think yeah we, we do even even like with the, you talk about the, the the temptation towards idolatry found amongst the people of Israel. I think it was Saint John Chrysostom who suggested that that was actually a kind of desire for the incarnation. That they wanted to be actually to have God as something they could actually. Um, you know, see, they wanted to have um, God revealed to them. And being, being the fact that they were, being, since the case was that they were carnal, that took, it took very bad forms, but it's actually rooted in desire for God. So that actual spiritual spark is still there. It's just easily corrupted. Can we take a test case from the arts how about this? You're speaking with your class, this class or the other class, and you you say, uh, probably none of you want to be creative. And since none of you really want to be creative, I'll teach you the Netflix formula. Uh, the Netflix formula goes something like this. <clears throat> we'll have the uh, pilgrims versus the expressive individualists. And you know, the pilgrims are piss poor and who would wanna be like them? Uh, so you wanna join the expressive individualists. Now, here's a chance to write uh, uh, 20 episodes in a new Netflix series in which the pagans uh, uh, nonplus the uh, putrid pilgrims and it'll be easy. Won't be creative, but this is the way you can go forward. Uh, it seems to me that uh, your students are going to want to be creative. And what happens, and you point this out, is that the, the Netflix approach uh, really sooner or later leads us to the formulaic rather than the creative. Any thoughts on that? Well, um, I think this will respond to both your question and Christopher's uh, thought a moment ago about the... Um, about the innate desire of, the, of, of at least the youngest people. Um, uh, I'm thinking of my actual classroom. I currently teach 49 uh, 11th graders. And, oh. <laughs> in two sections, but 49. Oh, oh okay, okay. Yeah. Um, of those 49, um, uh, I would, optimistically say i mean this uh, probably about 20 percent if i if i did the if i did the, if i flipped the assignment and said okay uh i'd make it a bit more simple you have to come up with pit, uh pitch me a show i want to you can work in teams of one two three or four your choice if you think you're not a creative person get a creative partner on board your team that's fine pitch me a brand new show and the criterion is I will then go and scour the internet and try to find your show in some existent form. You have to be completely unique and creative. 20% of my class is gonna be ecstatic about that. Um, 
80% of my class will throw up their hands in despair. Uh, they don't want to be creative. Now, I don't know that their desire really has anything to do with it either way. Um, they, would, they would come up with it because what my students want by and large, uh, this is another piece that I think is the classical theory lines up so easily with the liberal arts theory. Every student should want to learn for love of knowledge. Well, that's the goal. <laughs> the reality is that the vast majority of students learn for the grade. Uh, they, they, they will do whatever it takes to get that 100. So they will be creative, not because they are expressing the inner uh, resemblance to the divine, but I do think it's there whether they recognize it or not. They are made Imago Dei, but uh, they, they won't be excited about that. They won't like that in mass. Now, I flip the assignment and say, okay, here's a formula, go make me a show. What I think would actually happen is that uh, in the application of the formula, um, I don't know, 40 to 60% of the students would actually come up with something new through using the formula as a structure. <laughs> I mean, they would take the basic Marxist dichotomy of a rich group and a poor group that are opposed like about, I don't know, 80% of current TV shows seem to have this dichotomy in them. And they would come up with some brand new variation that's never been seen in the world before. Uh, but if the question is, do they desire to do the creative uniqueness? I think the majority of them are gonna say, no, they don't want that because that requires work. <laughs> they don't want to work. Now, what is really fascinating, and I think might be a more substantial proof of y'all's collective point, if I'm understanding your side of our, our debate here uh, correctly, they actually enjoy themselves so much more when they work hard and when they actually are creating something unique. And when they're doing that out of stuff that they've learned, uh, it's part of where in, at least in the, in the K-12 world, um, uh, Bloom's taxonomy is like the gospel of education and memorizing and learning specific data is low on the ladder. Creating something unique and new is the high point. It's the pinnacle of the pyramid, literally. But what I find happens is that students actually, they enjoy themselves best when they've learned a ton about a subject and then they go and make something new that's never existed before out of what they've learned, which I think does point back to the fact that they are made in the image of God and take us all the way back to the beginning of our conversation, satisfying their base desire for laziness. And let me just sit here and doodle and get an A actually doesn't bring them any particular joy. <laughs> ah, they... You've landed on your feet, my friend. You've landed on your feet. Mario, do you have any further thoughts? I would have, I would have geared up for a bit more war if I was, I would have, I would have read up on, uh, uh, Mary and Montgomery a little bit more before today. Instead oh, of, a hillbilly Thomas, very good. Oh, he's my favorite. I, I love his, his phrase. I got that phrase, the nature of things from uh, Mary and Montgomery. And uh, the idea of giftedness, like that was huge. That shaped my teaching more than like any other book I read that year. Very good. Anyway. You know what, he went to speak at Russell Kirk's events in uh, uh, Piety Hill. Uh, people wanted to be very sure that they got a good chair because he spoke at great length. Mar Mario, do you have some final uh, probing questions? Because uh, uh, being ecumenical Christians, we're going to uh, end with today's gospel. Well, <laughs> I, I just remember um, what um, D.K. Chesterton said once when a teenager knocked the door of a brothel, he's knocking the door of heaven. But... Uh, <laughs> Why um, would you remember a thing like that, Mario? <laughs> so he, he summarized uh, very well. <laughs> but uh, nevertheless, um, this is my question. Do you think, given what you just said, that um, Christians need to be more creative and we are the one, Christians should be the one who are running a program like Netflix. Yes, because, right. a giant caveat. Um, so I'm just going to go back to that whole idea of tension and say, I'm going to put both of these out and say, I have no idea how to resolve it. That's a, that's a problem for someone else to figure out. I would love for, uh, I would love for Christians to be, and, and there's been movement in this over the last 20 years. 
I, I think there are a lot more Christians trying to get work in Hollywood than there were 20 years ago. Um, I would love for Christians to actively continue working in the arts. I think that's huge. I, I think the, the best art is created out of the strongest sense of truth. And it is literally the core of our faith that we know the truth. I mean, it's a shocking claim. <laughs> It only works if we're right. Otherwise, we are the most proud, hubristic people on the planet. If we're right, everyone else is wrong. Well, which that literally, if it's true that great literature, great stories come from the sense of truth, then we should be the best storytellers on the planet. Um, at the same time, uh, particularly in American Christianity, we would need a, an enormous... I have no idea how to deal with the fact that uh, the vast majority of Christians that, at least in my circles and that I'm aware of through reading and conversing with people, would bring a, an excessive moralism to excellent storytelling such that that would kill great storytelling. For example, uh, one of my favorite authors is a novelist. His name is Brent Weeks. Uh, he's another Hillsdale grad. He was uh, about a decade before me. Uh, he wrote an amazing trilogy of, uh, it's called the Night Angel Trilogy. It's all about the morality of assassination and the question of if you have the ability to assassinate an evil person, should you? Well, he went from there. That was a great trilogy. He just finished his uh, second series. It's a five book series uh, called the Lightbringer uh, Quintilogy, I suppose. And but in there, uh, it's, his fifth book has the most beautiful expression of the doctrine of God that you have ever read in a novel. Uh, I, I think he's right in that same tradition of Dante and Milton, but for 20th, 21st century in the form of high epic fantasy. At the same time, his novels are racy, his characters are raw. Uh, he intentionally, I listened to an interview he did on a podcast about a year ago, he intentionally, when he wrote his books, he decided uh, he tried to find a Christian publisher. Nobody would touch his books because the stories he wants to tell, uh, they contain too much raw human grit. Uh, it's the, the underside of the human experience. Christian book publishers won't touch it. Instead, they'll publish. Uh, I, I used to love Gilbert Morris until I cracked the formula and then was bored to tears. They'll publish a thousand reprints of Gilbert Morris's uh, Evangelical Methodist History of America. They won't touch a raw storyteller who actually uses profanity in his books. So, and again, that, and, but that also gets into the tension. So I would love to have Christian storytelling that has all of the excellence of mainstream storytelling that also is faithful to the traditional doctrine of the church. How to mediate all that? No idea. <laughs> but there's my there, there's my thought on your on your question, Mario. Excellent, thank you. I have one very short postscript that we could put in the form of a fraternal correction, and then that'll be enough of our wisdom, and we'll move to the wisdom of the scriptures. Uh, you use Josh the term consume as in consume this work of art, that work of art, this television series, that television series. And more and more we're hearing today about consumers of the news. Wouldn't it be better if we scrapped that term, at least we ourselves scrapped it, and, and talked about uh, critical engagement with the classics, critical engagement with the news rather than to talk about consumer. We have uh, consumerism enough, and I don't think we really want it to consume the discourse of, of art and rhetoric. I think that's an excellent uh, fraternal correction. I appreciate that. All right, uh, well, if you'll make a $20 contribution to the <laughs> open door, you can show your, your deepest appreciation. <laughs> And, and, and now, and now, as we say around here, forward lurch uh, from the gospel for today. 
uh, John. Jesus decided to go to Galilee and he found Philip and Jesus said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the town of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one about whom Moses wrote in the law and also the prophets, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. But Nathanael said to him, can, can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, here is a true child of Israel. There is no duplicity in him. Nathanael said to him, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. And he said to him, amen, amen, I say to you, you will see the sky opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Thank you. Thanks to all. I'll be in touch Thank by you. email. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, yes.